Mr. Chikata. Yes, my lord. Yes, uh, we want to have copies and consider it so we will rise and come back. Very well. For the issues. That is correct. Yes, okay. All right. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> So the, the court um, has just risen. Um, I think they, they are going into chambers to reconvene. But in the meantime, God has a special message for you. They say going cashless has never been this convenient and exciting. The Go e-payment system is now compatible with GH Link, the national payment platform. Now you can use your GH Link card on Go POS machine to purchase fuel. GH Link card offers additional payment option for fuel purchases at Go stations in addition to the Go card. Every fuel purchased is recorded automatically on your monthly bank statement, helping cardholders track and manage their expenses. So go ahead and use your GH Link card to buy fuel and all lubricants from any of Goyle's over 400 stations across Ghana. So go cashless and protect yourself and stick to all COVID-19 protocols in these times. Goyle, good energy. Goyle, Yang Arayendia. <laughs> So we go back to the Supreme Court and talk to Wilberforce Asari. Um, the court has just risen. What was it that made them rise this quickly after reconvening? Wilberforce, um, welcome back to the show. All right, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what exactly is it that has made um, that has gotten the, the court to rise this quickly after they reconvened? All right, so when the Supreme Court uh, constituted 
the lawyers for the petitioner were not seated. And so the lawyers for the first respondent and second respondent introduced themselves. Now, just after introducing themselves to the court, lawyers for the petitioner uh, entered the court premises. And in introducing himself, he said that he was at the registry of the court trying to file this memorandum of issues and also to file an application to review the ruling of the court yesterday. You know, yesterday the court ruled dismissing the application of the petitioner for interlocutory. So Chachi Chikata is saying to the court that he has filed an application for the Supreme Court to review that decision that they gave in the interlocutory uh, application. And so the Chief Justice announced that uh, he and his colleagues are rising to go and consider the memorandum of issues as has been filed. And so uh, that is why the court has risen. Uh, momentarily, I'm sure that the court will reconstitute and then will commence the business for the day. Benjamin. So um, with this filing, would the court now take a look at that application for the review of yesterday's decision before it goes on with the taking a look at the filing of the memoranda of issues as presented by the various parties okay so when the supreme court gives this ruling and you intend to review it what it means is that a larger panel has to be put together the panel that is hearing this matter is a seven member panel they took a unanimous decision to dismiss the application and so if you want to do a review what it means is that the chief justice will have to empanel uh, a nine-member Supreme Court panel or 11-member Supreme Court panel to review the decision. And so that will constitute a separate matter independent of the proceedings that are currently ongoing. Uh, I do not see if that will in any way stop proceedings because there is a substantive petition that is before the Supreme Court that they have to adjudicate. And so I'm sure when the court comes back, uh, they will... Um, give consideration to the memorandum of issues that has been filed, and then we'll proceed from there. Benjamin. But given that the determination of that review may influence the kind of um, evidence that now the petitioners would have going into the substantive matter, from the processes, is it not the case that the court is going to consider that application for review before it continues with the substantive matter? Well, um, I don't want to um, speak for the court, but what I want to believe is that the court is interested in meeting the timeline, strict timelines that are associated with the petition that is before it. And so I want to believe that uh, to the extent that a review of their decision must necessarily involve a different panel, uh, they are probably going to go ahead with the proceedings for the petition and we'll, constitute, we'll do separate arrangements for the review of the uh, decision of the court that was given yesterday. Um, if, if these are attempts to uh, delay the process, I'm not sure the Chief Justice is interested in that because uh, he signaled yesterday that he's interested in ensuring that they stick to the rules that has been set that the court is bound by, which is the rules in CI 99. And so we want to see how that will turn out in court today. Uh, for now, I'm unable to tell the direction that this will take, but it promises to be interesting when the court reconstitutes. Yeah, and talking about delays, yesterday we heard from court the counsel for the petitioner indicating that uh, their team takes a very strong exception to um, certain averments that they are seeking to delay the process. In the event that some of these processes, the back and forth, takes all of us to a point where, for any reason at all, we exceed that 42 days, does that in any way, I mean, make invalid in any way whatever decision that is going to come out ultimately from this particular hearing? Okay, so Benjamin, the line was breaking, but if I hear you, I'm sure you are asking about the 42-day rule that the Supreme Court sets for itself in terms of adjudication, the election petition, and its implications on the direction that the case is taking now. And, and specifically, that, specifically, whether if that day, number of days are exceeded, 
it in any way invalidates whatever decision that the court will make out of this particular case. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm very, very sorry about the line keeps breaking, but I'll attempt to answer the question because uh, what I sincerely believe is that the uh, Supreme Court is interested in adjudicating the election petition that has been brought by the petitioner. Now, if the petitioner is also interested in getting his substantive matter adjudicated within the timelines that have been provided, then it's entirely up to them to ensure that they let that process go on. So if there are any applications that are coming to the court that are threatening to uh, derail the time that has been set by the rule, that is the 42-day rule, then the court will make it clear to the applicants or the petitioners that uh, these applications are what is affecting us, and that is why we might not be able to uh, do as the rules are saying that we should do. And so we haven't gotten there yet. I don't know what the court will say, but at least what I do know is that the Supreme Court is bent on respecting its own rules and making sure that this matter is adjudicated within the shortest possible time and within the timeline set for itself. Okay. Um, Wilberforce, if us and when there are any further developments, we'll reach out to you and then we can engage further on what is happening. Thank you very much for joining us once again. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Okay. So that's Wilberforce Asari, who is our court correspondent and also head of our political and legal desk, um, who is giving us an update of what is happening at the Supreme Court um, in respect of the 2020 election petition. Coming in house, Nanaya is here with me, and let's talk about something else. So today, finally, 20th January has arrived. Donald Trump, when election results were declared, he, he disputed results, he went to court in a number of the states some of the states where he ordered, I mean, that he was able to secure recounts. Recounts were done, and Biden got even more votes. Um, some of the states that he had actually, his people had won. That's the, for the Senate and House of Representatives. Some were even turned around in favor of the Democrats. Finally today, the inauguration of Joe Biden is going to happen. And I hear all of these things happening from then till now. We are here now. Hmm. What does that portend for the American state? Uh, well, you, one may well wonder. Uh, um, then with um, you know, the, the rate at which uh, events have developed in the United States or unfurled in the United States, it's almost like watching the, 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 the evolution of the coronavirus vaccine. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the coronavirus itself. Um, uh, uh, you, you you don't know which direction it's going to take next. So I think yesterday there was talk that President Trump was saying he was going to form his own party. He was going to break away from the Republican Party and come up with a new electoral, some form of um, vehicle, which he regards as perhaps more appropriate to his thinking uh, and uh, his style of campaigning, uh, presumably to make some kind of comeback. Uh, in 2024, uh, he then announced uh, there's been this continuous thing about is he going to be president, present at the inauguration of Joe Biden or is he not? Uh, it seems pretty certain he is going to make himself absent from the inauguration ceremony in a weird echo of what we have seen recently in Ghana. Uh, and in his last few hours, he has been busy handing out uh, pardons, I believe almost 100, to all kinds of wonderful people, including Steve Bannon. Uh, uh, his uh, former, uh, if you like, uh, his chief strategist, his brain, uh, the man who proudly uh, claimed that he actually created Trump. He found the phenomenon and shaped him according to Russian principles that he had discovered, which he regarded as superior to the, model, uh, the American model of democracy and campaigning. Uh, he was up on fraud charges uh, in connection with missing donations uh, towards building... Uh, the wall, the Great Wall, do we remember it? It seems like a very long time ago. Between, um, between the U.S. and Mexico. Between the U.S. and Mexico, uh, presumably to keep out all the, the nannies and the house helps and the farm hands who help keep the American economy going along. Um, he's been given a pardon. Uh, Kodak Black, uh, the rapper, 
uh, and uh, uh, Lil Wayne, mm. um, both people uh, who have faced multiple arrests in connection with firearms possessions and possession of drugs, um, repeatedly since, in, in one case since 2013, and in another case, since, I believe, since 2017, uh, they've both been given pardons, presumably so that uh, when the great comeback happens, uh, if the Kanye West strategy did not work out, there will be some people who are into rap who kind of think that Donald Trump is down with the kids, you know, uh, because he's, you know, pardoned. Oh, no, no, yeah. No, I mean, you know, it's, it's all part of political strategy, I think. Um, but the moves are quite curious. Uh, the, the, the security situation continues to be tense. Uh, and I believe yesterday we were reading about how there had been warnings that there might be inside action from within the, the National Guard troops uh, who have been deployed to guard the ceremony, all 20,000 of them uh, at the Capitol, uh, the suggestion that some of them inside may have been radicalized. So the US Army was having to vet its own personnel all over again mm. to try to remove any elements who might pose a danger from within. I mm. mean, it's, it's, a, it's not a good situation. And yet it should be a moment of hope, at least if you're pro-Democrat, uh, to see the arrival of a relatively liberal president who has been very quick off the mark with uh, proposing a $1.9 trillion stimulus to get the economy going again, and importantly, as an urgent matter of the first thing, you know, presenting himself to be vaccinated um, against COVID-19, as opposed to um, certain public health measures suggested by the outgoing 45th president of the United States involving drinking bleach. <laughs> that very infamous advice that came from Donald J. Trump, um, the 45th president of the United States of America. It's been all kinds of um, responses across the world, giving, I mean, in, in connection with Donald Trump leaving the White House. Um, in terms of processes around the transitioning, we know that um, the Air Force One is going to pick him and then fly him out of the um, White House. Uh, I guess in his case, probably he'll be going to um, Florida because, mm -hmm. I mean, oh, unless now, now he's moved to, uh, he changed his, his, his state. Yes, he changed his state to, was it Pennsylvania? Is that where he changed it to? Uh, uh, because he used to be with Florida, then he changed yes, his state, yes. yes. No, no more Mar-a-Lago, Mar-a-Lago's out of fashion, probably because the neighbors are annoying him. Um, I'm, I'm amazed he's not changed it to Georgia. I thought he wanted to make it his center of operations. Yeah, well, okay, it was one of those states. I think it was either Georgia or Philadelphia, yeah. one, one of those, yeah. And I mean, seeking to, I think the, the quest was really to gain or garner a lot more votes in that new um, state, but clearly that didn't seem to work out as well. So yes, that's the big story as far as global news is concerned. Donald Trump is leaving office, and I think the US is around this time are going to be about five hours ahead of us, and that is, uh, event is supposed to take place at 8 a.m., um, I think, US time. So here we are looking just within the region of maybe 1 p.m. or maybe 2 p.m. thereabout. And we are going to be here um, as, on Asasi Radio. We're going to bring you all the updates. But locally, we know that the Supreme Court um, is seated. Um, well, they just rose to, to wait for the petitioner to file his application um, to have the, a review of yesterday's decision by the court. Um, in, in his... In his verdict, or in the, his, the ruling as delivered by the Chief Justice yesterday, he did indicate that the petitioner made reference to the instant case of Nana Adodamko Kufuadu and two others versus um, John Dramani Mahama and the Electoral Commission, indicating that the court at the time granted the interrogatory's application as filed by the petitioner, then that's an Anado Danko Ekufuado. But then, subsequent to that, there have been changes, especially with the coming into force of CI 99, um, and certain provisions that it makes in terms of the timelines, among other things. And there have been other enactments that now change um, that allowance for joining, for joinder, among other things. So, 
they are unable to grant that particular application. And so that application was dismissed. Um, that is what the counsel for the petitioner is seeking to have a review of um, going into today's hearing. But we have the news team um, from the Elizabeth O'Hini newsroom joining us to give us the news updates at 10 o'clock. Banana, just before um, they take over Tina Moses representing the newsroom, this beta banter, as described by Beatrice Edu, that ensued between um, the counsel for the petitioner and Nene Amegache, uh, in connection with the reference to the specific name of the chairperson of the EC chair. H how did you find that? I, I thought it was, you know, exactly the kind of thing that uh, counsel for the petitioner would like. It's a moment of high theatre in the court proceedings. Um, uh, bitter, um, it may have been between the two parties. It was, it was very entertaining to everybody else, I think, who must have been watching it. Well, perhaps a bit annoying to some of the parties in the courtroom. But outside the courtroom, um, it's the kind of thing that um, uh, uh, kind of gives a point to the law. Uh, otherwise, a lot of us might think of it as, you know, um, a rather dull business. Um, uh, it, I think it was it was um, a valid point, uh, obviously made by uh, Justice Nena Megache, uh, that, you know, in seeking to address the matter, one should refer to the office uh, and less to the individual concerned. Mm -hmm. and, and on that note, we sign out for the second time on the ADS as Tina Moses from the Elizabeth O'Hilly Newsroom brings us the news update at 10. And you owe the public 